I want to first talk about um, the dosing schedule of OCV. Uh, as we've had several discussions uh, earlier in this meeting about what is the proper time timing for giving the second dose. So um, I, I should point out that this uh, these slides will be uh, showing work that is being done both at Johns Hopkins as well as uh, with partners. Um, so regarding the dosing interval, um, the, the current recommendation is for a second dose to be given two weeks after the first, as we've discussed here many times. The, um, this dosing schedule was actually the one that was used during the pivotal study in Calcutta, which defined the uh, effectiveness, the efficacy, and the duration of protection uh, with Shonacol, and then later we assume it was the same with Uvicol. Now, why was this two-week interval selected for uh, the study, the pivotal study in Calcutta? Well, that was based on an earlier large vaccine trial in Bangladesh, which actually used three doses uh, and with a six-week interval. Uh, that study showed that two, week, two doses was effective, that one dose was not effective. Uh, however, recall that that 1985 trial in Bangladesh used an earlier version of OCV. It was basically a, a very much like the one we currently use, but it's not identical. So the feeling was that we needed two doses, and we also assumed it would be used in outbreaks. So we wanted to get two doses in as quickly as possible, and it was thought that two two week interval would be about as fast as would be logistically possible and immunologically relevant. So the two dose interval was what was used. Now we know that in many campaigns it's not been possible to give the second dose at two weeks. Uh, next slide. And in fact, many, many times the second dose or the second, I should call it the second round because it's not always the second dose for people. The second, second round is often delivered after six months, eight months, even longer. And the question is, what do you do when it's delayed at such a long time? So two studies were set up, one in Zambia in collaboration with the Center for uh, Research in Infectious Disease, Zambia. Uh, a second study was set up in Cameroon with uh, Masante. Uh, both studies were uh, used a very similar design. Uh, they were all age, uh, sorry, uh, randomized. Uh, they were age stratified, so we had young children under age 5, 5 to 14, and older individuals. Uh, the primary outcome in both studies was the geometric mean titer of the vibricidal antibody two weeks after the second dose. So whether it was the second dose after two weeks or the second dose after six months. Um, in addition, unlike previous studies, these uh, included follow-up blood samples that were carried out three months and six months after the doses to see whether the titers remained elevated or whether they fell. Uh, the difference between the Zambia study and the Cameroon study, the Cameroon study uh, involved two groups, one at two weeks interval, the second group at six months interval. In Cameroon, we had a six month and also at 11 and a half months, essentially a one-year interval uh, between the doses. Um, and what we found was that if you gave the vaccine much later, at six months, it was not inferior to the dosing schedule of two weeks. Uh, and in fact, in Cameroon, it appeared to even be superior in terms of the geometric mean vibricidal titer. Now, very interestingly, the data was suggesting, we don't have the sample size to show it, but it appeared that the uh, improvement was especially important in the children under age five. 
so that this may be, it would require an additional study with a larger sample size to look specifically at the, at the young children. Uh, as I mentioned, the Cameroon study included the one-year interval, and in that case, again, it was um, uh, it appeared to be superior to the two-week interval. Uh, I should mention uh, a special note that the verbicidal antibody titers were, that assays were carried out in country using locally uh, isolated strains. Uh, and so, uh, in, in this setting up of this lab assay, which is not a trivial pursuit, uh, was only possible because of south-south transfer of technology between Zambia and Cameroon. Next slide. Uh, so there's trade-offs if you were to delay the second dose. We know that if you delay the second round, there'll be more people who will be getting only a single dose, but there will also be more people receiving at least a single dose. And so there are some trade-offs, and I think that would be worth some discussion, not at this session, but in the later session. Um, so next slide. I should clarify that when we measure vibricidal titers, we do not prove that this is more or more or less efficacious. A vibricidal titer is the best we have right now, but it's certainly not a good correlative protection if we're talking about a titer months later, because the titer falls to almost baseline within about three months. And yet we know that the protection lasts for many years. Now, I should, the other change, though, when you delay the second dose is that the, you get two peaks in titer. If you give it two weeks apart, you get one bump in antibody titer, and then it falls to baseline. If you delay the second dose, you get two increases in titer. Now, is that relevant? I don't know if that really correlates with disease, uh, with disease uh, prevention but it, it may be uh, relevant. I also want to mention that I think there's increasing evidence now that vaccines that are given at the longer interval, not just cholera, actually do improve uh, immunogenicity. But since we don't have a good uh, indication of protection, how do you measure actual protection? Well, of course, you can do a field trial, but we've done those, and it's really not possible to do field trials testing every possibility. Another way to do it with, is with the so-called CHIM, the Controlled Human Infection Model, where you put people into a hospital and you give them cholera, or, and then these would be people who had been vaccinated or given placebo. And this is done with a brand new vaccine, but you know this, is, uh, this makes people sick. You really can't do this very often. And we thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a volunteer model that did not make people sick, that could be done in outpatients, that could be done in developing countries, and could evaluate the, the uh, potential protection of new vaccines that we've been talking about, uh, new vaccine schedules, the duration of protection, the efficacy of booster doses. So in collaboration, in collaboration with uh, uh, Siders in uh, Zambia uh, and Harvard University, we've been looking at could we develop such a model with a non-toxigenic strain. So we used a strain from, from Zambia, created a non-toxigenic strain, and then created isogenic strains, that is an Ogawa and an Inaba, which is identical except for the LPS. Um, and this strain now, we know, colonizes the small intestine of infant, of infant mice, as is shown on the right-hand graph, that when you give this to infant mice, they do colonize the intestine, uh, but they don't, they don't um, make the uh, mice sick. The, the left-hand uh, graph shows that the a wild-type 
strain will kill the mice uh, within 32 hours, but the mutant strain does not kill the mice at all, even though it colonizes. Now, next slide. Uh, a side benefit of the creation of this strain is that we now have isogenic strains that are not virulent and could be more widely used for vibricidal assays. Uh, the current assays use the wild type strains and of course there's a biohazard associated with that, but in fact these new strains are, should not be biohazardous and the vibricidal titers are, are essentially the same as the standard uh, titers uh, now. Next slide. Uh, this, this slide shows really quite a different concept about uh, vaccine development for cholera. We're accustomed to a whole cell vaccine, and we think that the uh, virulence antigen that we need to attack is the O polysaccharide. This is uh, the basis for the vivicidal assay, etc. Um, this, this slide, however, illustrates the potential of a protein vaccine uh, for cholera. And specifically, it uses a technology called MIFA, which is a multi-epitope fusion antigen. What is done here is to identify the key virulence epitopes on the different protein antigens and make a fusion that actually makes a single protein that incorporates all of these proteins into a single protein. Uh, and when this, when this immunogen uh, is injected into uh, rabbits, it protects the rabbits from challenge. It also protects infant rabbits from challenge. And so this is a protective uh, vaccine in the animal model. Now the interesting thing about this is that we had hoped that it, there would be a protein that would look like LPS, that it would look like O polysaccharide, and therefore it would stimulate antibodies against O polysaccharide and it would stimulate vibricidal antibodies. As it turns out, it does not. That part of the protein did not work, and so it does not stimulate vibricidal antibodies. There's no polysaccharide, and yet it still protects. So I think what we're saying here is that it's challenging some of our concepts about what you need in order to protect. And theoretically, such a protein could be added, for example, to an O polysaccharide conjugate vaccine. Next slide. Uh, next, I want to just talk a little bit about micro hotspots. I know you've had a lot of discussions about how to identify hotspots. Um, and in general, most people have been identifying the hotspots at the district level. Uh, we've been working, speaking about Nigeria. Yes, we are doing research in Nigeria. <laughs> uh, uh, but also in Kenya, we've been analyzing the data there on hotspots. And I think two features that we find is that when you identify a, a district that is identified as a hotspot, there are both hot microspots and cold microspots within that hot district. And similarly, there are hot microspots in a cold district. Uh, and so when you put these together, if you, if you don't identify the hot microspots in the cold district, you're going to be leaving out a large number of people. And this, this uh, table shows that there would be 1.6 million people misidentified uh, in the cold spots. And also, perhaps you'd be giving vaccine to other individuals in the hot districts who are living in a cold microspot. So maybe you're wasting some vaccine there. Now, logistically, I know there's reasons that you may want to include the entire district. So I'm not saying that this is a recommendation, but I think we need to recognize that there are microspots within both hot and cold districts. And I will turn the 
Glory to uh, Andrew Eisman. Mm -hmm. We're about minus 10 minutes, so I'll, be, I'll just present one slide. Um, so uh, one other project we have is uh, another study on the impact of OCV. Um, and this is in South Kivu in DRC in conjunction with Dr. Placid, INRB, um, the London School. And the three objectives are to estimate the impact on clinical incidents and deaths uh, from 2021 to 2026. The OCV campaign was conducted in um, August to October 2020. Um, we'll also be working on doing annual surveys to understand the evolution of vaccine coverage in the population, care seeking, human movement, so we can kind of account for some of the changes in the population over time when interpreting uh, the clinical incidence data. And we'll also be doing serial sero surveys to understand um, not only medically attended cholera, but also infections in the community. Um, a lot of the methods are similar to, to what some of the, the things that Anais from Episant described. Uh, we're also working with INRB in Goma, so we're, we're coordinating efforts to have standard protocols for qPCR, culture, and, and, and the serologic assays. So we'll have nice evidence from a few different sites to compare. Um, and we'll also be working with them to better characterize the molecular attributes of, of the bacteria after, before and after um, vaccination. And I think that is, yeah, I'm happy to discuss questions with anyone about this, but it's, it's quite similar to, to what Anais described, and I think I'm out of time. So thank you. <laughs>